thank you, thank you all again for coming. Uh, we are Sludge. Stop land use damaging our ground and environment. So what is in these basins exactly? Uh, according to Denali, there's many things that go into them. Wastewater residuals from food and vegetable processing plants, animal processing plants, and so on. Uh, processing wash down rinse water, flocculated solids, dissolved air flotation skimmings, waste activated sludge, wastewater lagoon sludge, grease trap waste, organic solids, and semi-solid residues. I'm sure most of you could probably figure out what a lot of these things are, but we'll dig into it a little bit. <laughs> You'll hear terms like biosolids or sludge, and those can all mean different things to different people. Uh, first, we need to make sure that we really know what we're talking about. Chicken litter is not a biosolid. Litter is what comes from the houses where the chickens are raised, including the bedding materials, droppings, or manure, and is almost an ideal fertilizer from in many instances. Uh, biosolids, however, are more typically the waste from a factory where millions upon millions of animals are killed, cleaned, cut, and processed here. into products we buy at the grocery store as well as many, many other things. Um, a publication issued by the Alabama Extension in 2020 states that the four most common byproducts from chicken plants are blood, feathers, chicken heads, and non-edible viscera. Those byproducts, when skimmed from wastewater treatment ponds at the facility, become biosolids. Do you ever wonder why the odor sticks so strongly to your hair, your clothes, and seeps inside of your house? The answer is DAF and FOG, the dissolved air flotation skimmings, and the food oil and grease. Uh, dissolved air flotation skimmings are, it is an industrial wastewater treatment um, it is a water clarification process that uses micro bubbles to remove impurities and solids. The process uses micro air bubbles that attach to lightweight impurities and solids that float to the water surface. And then a skimming system removes the sludge and clean water is recovered. These dissolved air flotation skimmings are what ends up in our lagoon. It is not the clean water. Grease trap waste. Now, if any of you have ever been in a restaurant, I'm sure you are familiar with grease trap waste. And if you've ever been behind a restaurant, you might be familiar with how gross those can get. Uh, they contain grease, water, sediment, and mostly food particles, and contaminants that are washed down the drain. Trace compounds tend to accumulate, such as heavy metals, volatile organic compounds, sulfur, pesticides, and detergents. This also includes all of the chemicals that are used in the cleaning process throughout the entire restaurant, uh, and just anything at all that goes down that drain. Uh, spray application of grease trap waste on fields where vegetation or crops are being grown can coat the plants with grease, suffocating the above ground portions of the plant, resulting in reduced yields. Spray application on the land can also coat the surface of the soil with grease, making it a water making that's, it water repellent and may stupid. clog soil pores. Wastewater residuals. Water treatment facilities mix coagulants into the water, which bind with a variety of trace contaminants, bacteria, salts, particles, and so on. These coagulated materials settle, taking the contaminants with them. Residuals are the coagulated materials removed from wastewater during the treatment process. They are known to contain a variety of heavy metals, suspended solids, organic chemicals, and PFAs. Of these wastewater residuals are from wastewater treatment plants where municipal wastewater is treated. Yeah. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
processing wash down rinse water. Wash down refers to the process of cleaning and manufacturing processing equipment using a high pressure spray of water and or chemicals. Everything that goes down the drain in this process, it, it can vary from the chemicals they use to clean the equipment itself or even all of the guts and the blood and the gore from all of those animals. Wastewater lagoon sludge. Now this one's interesting because a wastewater treatment lagoon is an earthen pond where wastewater is treated via natural and biochemical processes. Wastewater lagoon sludge is the biosolids that accumulate at the bottom of the lagoon, composed mostly of dead bacteria, algae, plants, sand, silt, gravel, and insoluble metals, or heavy metals. All of these things are mixed together and they are put into our lagoons. And at that point, they are considered biosolids, which is considered an organic fertilizer, despite the many chemical compounds that are contained within all of these materials that go into it. The biosolid waste is then hauled into fields for spreading and or to earthen basins, commonly referred to as lagoons. Although biosolids are beneficial to crops when used as an organic fertilizer and soil conditioner, they do contain contaminants at minute concentrations that can accumulate in soils through repeated land application and cause environmental pollution. These contaminants enter the environment through biosolid application on land, where they may persist, degrade, undergo transformation, or produce hazardous byproducts. Due to the variety of waste that are put into the basins, they can contain a number of contaminants. These include both organic and inorganic chemicals, heavy metals, PFAs, also known as forever chemicals, pharmaceuticals, surfactants and detergents, and pathogens including antibiotic resistant bacteria, viruses, and parasites. Uh, PFAs have recently become a very big concern throughout the country. Not a lot has been known about them up until very recently. And as more studies progress, we find out even more ways that they can harm us and our environment. Uh, this shows an example of some of the harmful health effects of PSA, PFAs. Now, not only does do PFAs affect our health, it also affects the health of animals. And since PFAs bioaccumulate, the animals that we eat are also bringing those PFAs into our body, you know, as well as the crops. Uh, heavy metals have long been known to cause some serious problems. The heavy metals commonly found in biosolids uh, include lead and arsenic and cadmium. The accumulation of heavy metals in soil becomes high over a long-term period of biosolid application, and even short-term use has been observed to raise their concentrations considerably. The Office of the Inspector General recommended that the EPA disclose to the public the fact that the chemicals in biosolids are not fully evaluated for safety and therefore safety claims or implications of safety are fraudulent. The Office of Inspector General's recommendations included that the EPA cannot make a determination on the safety of biosolids because there are unregulated pollutants found in the biosolids that still need to have risk assessments completed. Despite this recommendation, the EPA has made no changes. Now, these are a few examples of how these sludge or biosolids have impacted individuals around the country. Now, this individual, Jason, he used biosolids on his farm for a number of years. A cattle farm, as there are many around here. Um, after his farms were tested for PFAs, after the use of these biosolids, they were found to be riddled with it. His farm, entire farm, was seized. The meat cannot be sold. The crops cannot be sold. There is nothing he can do with it because all of it has been contaminated with PFAs, PFOS, and PFOA chemicals. Now, on a more local front, 
on public record is one incident where sludge was over applied at the back of a property near the McDonald Newton County line, causing excess residuals to run down a hillside onto a neighboring property and into a tributary of Indian Creek. Another such incident occurred near the community of Southwest City in McDonald County. 36 truckloads, or approximately 165,000 gallons, were land applied to a five-acre area and entered into the waters of that state. On a very local note, on October 19th at the Fairview Evans Basin, there was a hose burst that, that burst apart and dumped 6,000 gallons of waste onto our roads. Uh, the rose was closed, closed off to the public, and the Fairview Special Roads District had to spend time repairing the road after it had to be dug up to remove the waste spillage and new rock hauled in. This is time that taxpayers have paid the district that was meant to be spent repairing roads, signs, bridges, etc., and was used to clean up a spill. <coughs> That's all for the, the slideshow. Uh, thank you guys very much. Did you have something you wanted to say, Valerie? I have one thing that I want to add to um, what Taryn was saying about the animals that we eat. Um, there are regulations where they can't run their cattle on the land that's been, you know, land applied with this bio sludge for a certain amount of days. Um, however, that doesn't apply to the wild animals. You know, you're all out there hunting right now, deer, turkey, you know. They aren't held in by regulations. They're going to graze wherever they want. And if they're thirsty and they see a nice wet pile on the ground, they're probably going to start eating and drinking from it. So. Good evening, everybody. Can everyone hear me in the back? Before we get started, um, tomorrow is Veterans Day, and it's celebrated today. Raise your hand if you're a veteran. If you have your hand raised, stand up. to know that the sacrifices that these folks made as veterans is somewhat analogous to the sacrifice that y'all are making when you take on a company like Denali Water Solutions and what they're doing to affect your rural way life, okay? Um, a little bit about my background, I'm an attorney in St. Louis, I graduated law school from Mizzou, uh, after that I spent six years on active duty with the Navy. When I got off active duty, I was appointed as the chief counsel at the Department of Natural Resources in Jeff City under uh, Governor Ashcroft's second term. Uh, I ended up doing that gig for six years, and then I joined the largest law firm in downtown St. Louis. I did that until 2011 when I got fed up with all the corporate bureaucracy that everyone knows what happens in any organization like that. And I set up my own you know, law firm. In, in you know West County, St. Louis, and I like to spend my time instead of representing big corporations, helping folks like you. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. The first question: How many people that you represent actually win the court cases against big companies, similar to Denali? Well, um, I, I represent several citizen groups. That's an excellent question around the state. A lot of people uh, were opposed to large hog CAFOs coming in down the road from them. And they appeal permits, you know, take it up through the Court of Appeals, and there was a large hog CAFO proposed outside of Chillicothe. It never got built. There was a large hog CAFO called Tipton East uh, outside Clarksburg, Missouri, near Tipton. That never got built. So. Uh, it is possible to take on the big corporations and walk away with a win. You don't win every time, but 
you know, you cherish the ones that you do have. Did that answer your question, sir? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I have a little slideshow. We're going to go through it relatively quickly. But what this does, it's going to highlight some of the legal issues involving the, the way the state of Missouri deals with permits for companies like Denali Water Solutions. Okay? So uh, this is our public information meeting. I'm going to move this over here. So can you all see over here? Okay. What we're going to talk about today are permit requirements under what's called the Missouri Solid Waste Management Law. Contents of what's in the earthen basins. Um, you already have heard a good discussion describing what all that kind of toxic stew is. And are solid waste permits required for an operation like this? And finally, what is DNR doing to enforce the law that's been on the books since 1972? Permit requirements under the Missouri Solid Waste Law. In Missouri, there's a specific statute, and again, in 1972 was when the legislature passed the solid waste law, okay? And the definition of solid waste includes garbage, refuse, other discarded materials, including all kinds of stuff. But the key takeaway here is garbage, refuse, and discarded materials. So if you have a commercial or industrial operation and they have something that they don't need anymore, that they're discarding it, that arguably could fit in the def which should fit in the definition of solid waste. Next slide. Again, just uh, unpacking this in more detail. Garbage, refuse, other discarded materials, including solid and semi-solid waste materials resulting from industrial, commercial, agricultural, governmental, and domestic activities. It's very, very broad. Another question. So, um, take a compost pile, for example. You take your orange peels, your, your byproduct of the food you make for dinner, and you put it in the compost pile, and it actually helps the earth. Um, where's the scientific evidence that this byproduct from companies is harmful to the environment and not unlike our waste that we put on the compost piles? Again, an excellent question. If we could hold off the answer to that until the end of my presentation, we can get into that. Next slide. But, but there is an exception for the definition of solid waste. It does not include hazardous waste, which is, you know, are certain specialized things, you know, which are regulated by the EPA and the DNR. So solid waste is generally any discarded material that is not hazardous waste. Just keep that thought in your mind. Next question, or next slide. There's a... 260.205.1, this is the statute that requires people who process solid waste to have permits. And it's pretty long, so let's go to the next one. We'll unpack this a little bit. It shall be unlawful for anyone to operate a solid waste processing facility or solid waste disposal area without first obtaining an operating permit from the department. And the department is DNR. Next slide. Uh, but there is a narrow exception from that permit requirement. Because again, the permit requirement says if you process solid waste, which is any discarded material that's not hazardous waste, you have to have a permit to do that. Okay? The exception is a permit is not required if you have a waste stabilization lagoon, a settling pond, or some other type of water treatment facility. These are the only exemptions from the permit requirement. Next slide. A permit should not be required, again, if, 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 you're, if you fit into one of those three categories and you have a valid permit from the Missouri Clean Water Commission. These are the types of permits that Denali is currently applying for, permits from the Missouri Clean Water Commission. So question, why would a company like Denali uh, apply for permits from the Clean Water Commission if it looks like they're a solid waste company. And also in that context, um, if you look at Denali's website, it says we are a waste disposal company. If you look at records in, you know, maintained by the Arkansas Department of Environmental Management, the DNR equivalent in Arkansas, 
they issued over 250 permits to Denali. And on each of that permits, the company has to indicate what its SIC code is, a standard industrial classification code. Does everyone know what an SIC code is? It identifies what kind of business you're in. Okay, so if you're a barber, you have an SIC code. If you're a beautician, you have a different SIC code. So there's a specific SIC code for waste disposal companies, and that was the SIC code that's listed on all of those 250 permits. So Denali says they're a waste disposal company. They have 250 permits from Arkansas that says they're a waste disposal company, but yet on the two applications that they have pending for these two lagoons, and along with the lagoon or basin in Randolph County, they say they're a soil preparation service company, which is totally different from a waste disposal company. But it, the question is, well, why, are, why would they do this? Why, why are they, if, why are, if they're a leopard, why are they trying to change their spots? Why do they want to stay away from these solid waste permits? That's what the question is. Next slide. Uh, again, these, this, these are quotations from the website for the DNR about solid waste permits. To get a solid waste permit in Missouri, it's a five-step process. The first step is you have to do what's called a preliminary site investigation. That is a very detailed, you have to hire engineers and geologists and hydrologists and do borings, collect information about soils, about geology, about groundwater. They have, you know, it takes a considerable amount of time and it costs a lot of financial resources to do that. Afterwards, the, company, the applicant has to write up a report and submit it to the DNR. After they do their prolif after DNR approves that preliminary site investigation, the second step is they have to do what's called a detailed site investigation. DNR reviews the information that the company <coughs> gathered initially, and they make them drill down and provide even more detailed information. You have to install groundwater monitoring wells. You have to determine which way groundwater flows. You have to identify all these environmental resources that, that potentially can be impacted. And again, this costs, uh, you have to have experts do these for you. It takes a lot of time and it costs a lot of money for someone to do a detailed site investigation. So then, step number three. After months and months of conducting the detailed site investigation, they prepare what's called a geologic and hydrologic site characterization report. Again, you know, this could be a report like a couple inches thick. Again, prepared by expert engineers and geologists and hydrologists, and it discusses all of the things that they've been looking at over the last several months in accordance with the DNR requirements. And again, they have to, if we go back, it says, you know, they, the permit applicant must investigate and characterize the geology and hydrology of the site according to the approved work plan. They must interpret and summarize the geologic and hydrologic characteristics of the site in the detailed site investigation report. Again, it's a very time-consuming, expensive process. Step number four, once DNR reviews and approves this a geological hydrologic report, they then issue what's called a construction permit to the permit applicant. This authorizes them to go out and build the facility that they want to build. And again, it has some, you know, engineering plans have to be submitted and reviewed. Uh, again, like, like, like if someone wanted to, you know, build a building in Joplin or Springfield, you have to get a building permit, you have to submit your plans, you have to have an engineer draw all this up. Uh, again, a time-consuming process that you have to hire people to do it for you. It costs time and money. In step number five, after it's built, DNR goes out and inspects it, and as long as all the I's are dotted and all the T's are crossed, they issue what's called an operating permit. And an operating permit must be obtained before the solid waste landfill, and they use the word landfill, but it includes processing facilities, can begin accepting waste. And again, these are all quotes directly from the DNR on their website, okay? Next slide. So contents of the earth, so, so the takeaway there, again, it is a time-consuming process, costs a lot of money, 
for them if they wanted to pursue a solid waste permit. Contents of the earthen basins. We'll go through this quickly. Uh, what is placed in each basin? Uh, again, this is a direct copy of the management plan that Denali submitted to the DNR as part of its permit application for each of the three basins. This is this language is is cut directly out of their document. It says uh, primarily organic solids, semi-solid residues, wastewater treatment processes, and food processing plants, animal processing plants, animal food processing plants, so on and so forth. It kind of you know just again just remember the presentation that you just saw a few minutes ago, where she drilled down in detail about how nasty a lot of this stuff can be. Next slide. Uh, the, the DAS skimmings, dissolved uh, air flotation skimmings, a common product of wastewater pretreatment systems, which use flocculants. What a, a flocculant is a specific category of chemicals that, went, that are added to a water solution that forces any type of solid material that may be in the water or dissolved in the water to solidify and fall out to the bottom. That's what a flocculant is. Um, grease trap water, again, you know, pretty nasty stuff. Next slide. Are the waste placed in each basin regulated as solid waste? Next slide. Go back one. So this is the best slide of the whole thing. If you look at the left-hand column, these quotes are from the Denali management plan describing what goes in the loop in their basins. Organic solids, semi-solid, flocculated solids, animal fat, oil grease, collected from different kinds of plants. And that's compared to the right-hand column, which is the definition of solid waste. Do you see how those things kind of match up? Are you seeing that? Am I missing something here? Next slide. Everybody get a chance to read that. That's an important slide. The, the takeaway here is by Denali's own admissions in their management plans, the stuff that they collect from their commercial and industrial customers and put in these earthen basins is garbage, refuse, and other discarded materials, including but not limited to solid and semi-solid waste materials resulting from industrial, commercial, so on activities which is exactly what's described on the left-hand column. So clearly, what they're doing is they are processing, collecting and processing, and storing solid waste without any kind of DNR, the right kind of permits for it. Next slide. What is DNR doing to enforce the solid waste law? What are they doing to force Denali to comply with the law, which has been on the books since 1972? Is that a good question? Yeah. Okay. Next slide. Okay. Again, the permit requirements, 260.205.1, requires construction and operating permits unless, we're called a narrow exception, for a waste stabilization lagoon, a settling pond, or another water, uh, some type of water treatment facility. Okay. If, you know, in, in the environmental industry, particularly in the wastewater industry, a waste stabilization lagoon, a settling pond, and treatment facilities are specific types of structures and things which are associated with running a publicly owned wastewater treatment plant. You know, if everyone drives down the highway, Go through any rural community that has their own wastewater system, you'll see like a couple of lagoons side by side, and you'll see them gurgling around. That's the type of stuff this exemption is meant to address. Okay, next slide. Here's a copy of the uh, permit application for the that Denali submitted for the Evans Lagoon. Next slide. And here's the one that they submitted for the Gideon Lagoon. Again, they're just applying for permits under the Missouri Clean Water Law. In other words, they're trying to fit in under that exemption from not having solid waste permits. They're trying to portray themselves as, hey, we must fit in with this exemption, so give us a water permit from the Clean Water Commission. That's what they've applied for. Next one. 
and they did the same thing for the facility up in Randolph County for their Jacksonville Basin. Again, they're just applications for non-domestic wastewater permits. Next slide. So the question is, are the basins that Denali has, are they a waste stabilization lagoon? Are they a settling pond? Are they some type of water treatment facility? Next slide. Um, I asked that question to uh, an expert that I know. Uh, the guy is a professional engineer, has been a professional engineer in the wastewater industry for 50 years. He used to be, he used to work for the uh, Corps of Engineers. He used to be the head of environmental engineering at Anheuser-Busch in St. Louis. For several years so I mean he, he knows what he's talking about and so this is a quote from an affidavit that he provided us I have the following professional opinions the earthen basins constructed by Denali and the manner in which they are proposed to be operated are not waste stabilization lagoons the basis for my opinion is that the basin will develop a surface layer of fats oil and grease the fog from the prior uh, presentation, which will prevent the exposure of what's in the basin to either sunlight or atmospheric oxygen, which are the key requirements for the functioning of a stabilization lagoon or a pond. So clearly, they're not, it's not a waste stabilization lagoon. Next slide. Uh, the earthen, this is a, his second opinion. The basin's constructed and the manner in which they're going to be operated are not settling ponds. The basis, for my opinion, is that the basin will have a very long retention time, up to a year, which will allow what's called anaerobic conditions to develop in the solids which settle at the very bottom of the basin, which will create putrefaction. That's how something breaks down and smells bad. The result of that, the biological decomposition of the organic matter, will be malodorous substances associated with anaerobic conditions. Anaerobic means at the very bottom of, this, of these 20-foot basins, there is no sunlight, there is no oxygen, it's an anaerobic condition. Anaerobic means without oxygen as compared to aerobic, which means with oxygen. And just the way they're designed and operated, they're not a settling pond. Next slide. And finally, he concludes that the basins are not any type of treatment facility. They have no design which will evaluate what the wastewater going in uh, and, the, and the treatment performance is going to be measured. There's no mechanical equipment to control the system. And the basin will function only as a storage facility and will not achieve any discernible degree of water treatment. Significantly, in their management plans for each of these three basins, Denali admits we're not providing any type of aeration, we're not providing any type of engineer treatment to any of these. So by their own admission, really, they're not a treatment facility. So if, if they're not a waste stabilization lagoon, go to the next slide, Val. If they're not a waste stabilization lagoon, and they're not a settling pond, or they're not a treatment facility, why is DNR letting that exemption apply to them? Because they get paid off. Yeah. And again, this is just, uh, I was talking about Dennis Stack, registered, registered PE, 50 years experience. He used to work with Black and Beach, a you know, big engineering firm in Kansas City, uh, with Corps of Engineers in Buffalo, uh, with a big national consulting company. Again, 1978 84, manager of environmental engineering for Anheuser Busch. Do you think AB is going to hire somebody that doesn't know what they're doing? I don't think so. So, Dennis is extremely credible. And we're also getting a, a second affidavit from a gentleman, Buddy Bennett. Buddy, uh, also has 40 years of experience in the wastewater industry. He's run municipal uh, wastewater plants in several cities around the state. And more importantly, from 2012 to 2017, Buddy served on the Missouri Clean Water Commission. In 2016 and 27, he was the chairman of the Missouri Clean Water Commission. And he's provided an affidavit that says, I agree 100% with what Mr. Stack 
conclusions are. So if, they, if you have, a, you know, two 90 years combined experience in the business, they say this exemption doesn't apply. I mean, what more do you need? Next slide. What action has DNR taken to enforce the law? Nothing. Next slide. Um, this is a, a screenshot from DNR's website. You can do a search and list all the different permit applications that Denali currently has applied for. Um, one, two, three, four, five. They have five permit applications pending for different facilities. Next slide. So they're they're you know they're not sitting idly by you know they're coming. Okay, if they're not coming, they wouldn't be submitting these applications. And for the uh, are them applications all in the local area? There's an application for the Evans Lagoon, the Gidding Lagoon. The Jacksonville Where's Basin. Where are they at? Where's Jacksonville? Is in Randolph County. It's in between Macon. The, that lagoon is like two miles south of Macon. And there's a similar group there called the Citizens of Randolph County Against Pollution. They're fighting that. Their acronym is CRAP. <laughs> <laughs> that left us with barks. So we have a sledge. <laughs> But again, there, there's you know Fairview, Stella, uh, the one in Jacksonville, one in Sykeston, and one in Kaleo. I don't know where Kaleo is. Does anyone know where Kaleo, Missouri is? We'll have to look it up. But those are the ones they're applying for. Does someone have a question? If you could raise your hand. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I don't think this. I don't think Denali does any spreading on state property. No, what I'm saying is, does, does Missouri, the state of Missouri, get a kickback basically from the? Well, Missouri. whenever, whenever, whenever the DNR issues a permit to anybody, essentially to do anything like a water discharge permit like this, um, or a hazardous waste permit or a solid waste permit, there's an annual permitting fee that they have to pay. And that, that could range between, you know, five hundred to fifteen hundred dollars and you know, something like that. But those funds generally are you know, go to specific dedicated funds that the legislature has to appropriate out. So so it's so these permit by by if, if what you're intimating is well, does DNR get some kind of kickback by doing this stuff? I, I, I don't really think so. I mean the system is not set up to work that way. But again, the question but it is, you know, it begs the question, well, why are they doing this when it's so apparent what they're doing is wrong? Someone else had a question, ma'am. Thank you. I'm, I'm a little confused. If Baby Evans property is in the application, the permit application process, in that stage right now, how is it they're able to already operating with that other property? Well, that, that's a good question. Uh, it's my understanding that when the two facilities in Southwest Missouri were first constructed, they were uh, given authorization by the Missouri Fertilizer Control Board to operate because the you know, what came out of their basins was categorized as a, a beneficial uh, soil amendment or some kind of fertilizer. So that continued for several years. But this earlier this spring, uh, the Fertilizer Control Board apparently decided, you know, uh, this stuff really isn't, you know, doesn't have that much nu nutrient value in it as a soil amendment. So we're not going to issue, we're not going to do these permits anymore. So Denali and uh, 16 or 17, 18 other companies who were operating under those permits from the Fertilizer Control Board were left in this vacuum that they had been operating with fertilizer permits for a long time, but now they, they didn't have a fertilizer permit anymore. And DNR always had a regulation that, hey, if you have a fertilizer board permit, 
you don't have to have a permit from us. So DNR wasn't regulating. So that's the that's the status that's been going on since June. Okay. So at that point, wouldn't they start the process of the five steps? Uh, no we we think we think they should as a solid yeah. waste permit, right. but, the, but they don't want to spend the time or money. That's why they <laughs> submitted those three form A permit applications. But they no longer have a permit that allows them to have that there without going through the five steps through the NR. Well, right? that's that, that's one of the points in our lawsuit that really, if you look under the Missouri Clean Water Law, Chapter 644 in the revised statutes. Uh, there is no authority for DNR because what, what DNR did on June 23rd, they sent a letter out to these 18 or 19 companies, including Denali, that said, hey, we know that you don't have your fertilizer permit anymore and you, have a, and you don't have a permit from us right now, So, but we're going to let you continue to operate as long as you uh, do you know, A, B, C, and D. So and DNR is calling that enforcement discretion. But if you look under Chapter 644, there's no statute that says DNR has discretion whether to enforce the law or not enforce the law. So that's another point in our lawsuit that they're allowing Denali and only you know to operate illegally. Yes. Say this is what they're dumping. That's good, but this dumping go on. That's my understanding. Mark, you had a question? Yes. Yeah. Will the uh, DNR in, in processing their applications, this biosolid waste lagoon, under their criteria, will that be on hold until the lawsuit between Denali and Sinegro is resolved and they're suing the Missouri Fertilizer Control Board? Is that lawsuit well, still in process? It's, it's, it's my understanding, I, I'm not involved in any of this litigation, Denali has filed a lawsuit against the Fertilizer Control Board saying the Fertilizer Control Board doesn't have the authority to cancel fertilizer permits. That case is ongoing in Jeff City right now. And it's also my understanding Denali has, a, or, or someone else is suing Denali for contaminating their property down here. And I, that's all I know about that, very, very general. But, but neither of those two lawsuits directly impact what we're talking about. Next slide. What, what you were asking before we steps on, um, so the lawsuit that we have filed is not against any of the landowners, okay? It's not against Denali directly. It is against the DNR for not enforcing that law, not making them have the proper permits. So that's- That's the basis of your suit. That is our suit, and it is against the DNR, as is um, Randolph County. He also represents them. We are working in leagues with them um, as far as resourcing back and forth our committee, their committee, um, Mr. Jeffrey. Um, and so what it, it is against the DNR is because they are not enforcing the law the way that, it re that they should. You got another question? When is the court date? Uh, both lawsuits have been just recently filed, so there really is no court dates. Like, I'd like to have a trial or anything like that. That'll be months and months away. You know the questions right now? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. In accordance with law, is DNR not required to do soil testing once the sludge has been applied to the ground? There's no requirement in the law for DNR to do any testing of any kind. How about EPA? Uh, I don't believe this is an area that EPA really regulates. Okay. It's kind of it's kind of a void. It, you know, to the casual observer, it could appear Denali is trying to work its way into a certain amount of loopholes. Doors are cracked open a little bit, and they snuck through. But EPA has a biosolids program. Is that not correct? Yes. EPA also has a sludge management program, which says the only kind of sludge that could be land applied is sludge from a wastewater treatment plant. Right. And obviously, this sludge 
you know, you know, it doesn't come from wastewater treatment plants. So conceptually, they could be in violation of federal that federal law. And can we not reach back to EPA Region 7? There's absolutely nothing preventing anyone from contacting EPA Region 7 and Lenexa. Okay. Thank you. you had a question. Yeah. What, will your lawsuit require DNR to inspect the applications also? Because they've applied this. They've uh, their application process shows the properties they plan on spreading this on. Will DNR inspect those to see if they're properly? Uh, applied on those properties? Uh, there is no legal requirement for DNR to do that, so we really can't ask a judge to order them to do something that they don't have a legal obligation to do. In the event that there's a spill, you know, DNR will eventually send an inspector out to look at a situation, just like what happened with the road spill <coughs> here a couple weeks ago. Question. Why is DNR in Denali refusing to test um, parts that have been contaminated by the open flow? Like in Fairview, there was a that it spilled into it into a field. Why did DNR refuse and Denali both refuse? You, you would have to ask DNR and Denali that. I don't know. And I don't think anyone here in the room knows why. Ever, do you think they ever intend on testing water supply and soil? Uh, I, I, you'll, again, I, I don't know what DNR does. You'd have to direct that question to them. Let's move ahead. Next slide. Is there a way to force DNR to comply with the law? This is a copy of the uh, of petition, and this, and this, and when this was filed, the you know, certain amount of information was available to us. But since then, we have more information. So this is being redone and refiled, but. You know, the thrust of it is still the same. Uh, this is a copy of the law. Well, that's the case number, 23 ACCC 006461, Cole County Circuit Court. If anyone goes on CaseNet, does everyone knows how to do CaseNet? It's all open to the public now. Next slide. We haven't got in there twice. What would, so these lawsuits have been so as was alluded to a few minutes ago, the people in Randolph County have sued the DNR. The people here have sued DNR. So the question is, what's DNR's response? Are they willing to say, you know, maybe we should look at this a little bit differently and, you know, do the right thing? What's their response been? Well, they had the Attorney General's office file a motion to get the lawsuit thrown out of court. So, in lieu of sitting down and trying to have a reasoned discussion with reasonable people, they just, uh, we're right, you're wrong, we're getting your law, trying to get your lawsuit thrown out, which only costs more time, more resources for you guys, the people who are fighting the battle, unfortunately. Next slide. Be glad to answer any questions if I can. Sir, in the back. There's multiple ways to scan a cap. Why, I mean, everybody in this room must have property values affected. I guarantee you property values have went down. People didn't want to sell their houses close to properties close to this community. Why is not there, is there not a way to file a class action lawsuit for property devaluation? Each individual has a crew have, have evaluations done on their property. How much that assess value or real money? Have we lost on our properties due to these lagoons? And go after the people operating these lagoons and sue them for the devaluation of the properties. That, that's an excellent question. The type of lawsuit where, where people either individually or as a class action <coughs> file a lawsuit against someone else for damaging your property or loss of economic value to your property, those are called nuisance lawsuits. It's a private nuisance lawsuit, okay? Um, in 2013, the General Assembly passed a statute that says if you have an agricultural facility that has a permit from DNR, as long as they're complying with the permit, they are immune from nuisance suits. So there's the law that prevents you from being able to do that. 
which could be another reason why Denali says we're not a waste disposal company, we're now in the soil preparation business. Question in the back. Well, the, the, th the thrust about uh, the forever chemicals is, is exactly that. It's impossible to get rid of them. And whether or not someone's drinking water is impacted or not, um, you have to collect some water samples to get them analyzed. I know the, who was it this year? Someone was coming down to do some limited water testing a few days ago. Missouri Coalition for the Environment came down and then also the Chicken Yes, sir. <coughs> question about the Missouri Department of Conservation because they are a, a major landowner all throughout the state of Missouri. Um, based on, you know, it's my understanding, uh, I have not had any contact with MDC. I don't know what anyone locally has. That's part A to your answer. Part B, of, they, <laughs> well, well cl clearly the Conservation Commission does have some, you know, political capital in Jefferson City. But again, based on my experience and you know, any type of potential environmental uh, case like this, the Department of Conservation typically stays, remains on the sidelines, and they will not engage. Yes, ma'am. Um, did I hear you say that the local extension office uh, was called to come out and do soil and well uh, testing? I, I, I'm not sure exactly who all got the letter, okay, but there was a letter that came out to certain um, homeowners within a certain distance of the Evans Lagoon in Newton County. And that's because of all of the um, commotion being made about the different problems that we've had with it. Um, I know we got a letter. Um, I, I don't know, I mean, you guys would know if you got one or not. Um, the Missouri Conservation um, for the environment, got grant money to come out and test some of the, oh, hey, we got a hand up. That letter you got, was that from the Newton County Health Department? No. Okay. Uh, I can pull it up in a second, but you know, I've done it on my phone, but. Um, so they came out initially, their grant money was just to do some very basic testing. It's very similar to what the health department would do. Um, nitrates, phosphates, chlorides, things like that. Um, I think a lot of it is they're trying to get a basis for where our ground is right now. Are they seeing problems already? Are we going to see if they retest in, you know, one year, five years, is it getting worse? You know, that's, that's a lengthy process. It's not a one-step test and we got everybody's answer. That takes research and time. Um, they did partner with Truman, um, who came out, um, and they were testing for the pathogens, like Salmonella, E. coli, and the Missouri Coalition was testing for more of those nutrient-type things. Um, they told me it would take about a month before we had any results from it. So. If there is little to no testing, where's the proof that this isn't just another, well, as I said earlier, compost pile? Or just from a company that's not going to There is a lot of proof out there from many different states. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, it's it's out there. Um, so a lot of different, like the example <laughs> that I there from that farmer, his whole 300 acre farm had to be shut down. and. Um, Theirs with the contaminants they had with those forever um, chemicals, you can't get rid of that. That's why they have that name, okay? Contaminates the soil, the animals, the drinking water. And I mean, you can spend honestly an hour online and you can find multiple sources, legitimate sources to back it. Um, you know, there's, there's media coverage nowadays everywhere. We see it tonight. Um, and you know the question you had, Sarah, about the Missouri Department of Conservation? So. Look around, we're packed out the doors. 
guys, this has been three weeks of four to five people working on this. Three weeks, and look what we've got together, okay? So we haven't had a chance to reach out on all of those avenues with the EPA and things like that. We are working on it hard every day. I promise you, ask my husband. He hasn't seen me for three weeks. I'm in front of the computer, on the phone, 24 seven, um, as is the other members. And we are, we are trying to track down those avenues to find where we can find those resources to help. But as Mr. Jeffrey said, sometimes you get one Steve, department, I'm, I'm Steve, <laughs> yeah, my husband says, oh, so you just call Senator Carter Jill now, huh? <laughs> I'm like, well. <laughs> um, so it, it takes time to get those on board, but sometimes one department may not want to deal with the other department stuff. And so we might run into a crossroads with, you know, finding some other resources to help. But um, you mentioned the EPAs. I, I put a note in my phone right then, you know, Senator Carter's up here making her notes like, we're, we're on it, guys, I promise. We don't have all the answers now, but we are trying. And I know many of you have said, and I, I've seen it online, I've seen, you know, where we've written comments on Facebook or heard someone talking to somebody else, and, you know, somebody needs to do something. Why doesn't somebody make a committee? Why doesn't somebody sue them? We're on it, okay? All of us, I, I've lived across from it since that Evans Lagoon went in. I've hated it from day one. I've tried to stay back. My husband spreads fertilizer, chicken fertilizer. You know, who am I to say? So I sat back, idle, hating it, fussing about it, you know, complaining with my neighbors about it. But then I started researching about it and finding out what's in it, okay? That scares me. That scares me for my family, my, my future grandchildren, their children. You know, we, these farms that have found these chemicals where these, you know, reports and things come from, it didn't happen the first year or two in. 10, 15 years, 20 years, and people will say, oh, they've been spreading it for you know, X amount of years. They have, but they haven't done it like they've been doing it in excess here. We are getting slammed, we are getting drowned in it, okay? I can sit and watch them spread that field across from my house. It'll be nothing for two weeks. It's still wet and full of grease and just nasty things that are accumulating that can't even absorb in because they've drowned it in these just terrible things that are inside of this. Um, so the, and you know, we just gave you a, a small glimpse tonight of what those materials are. I beg you, spend the day, get online, go to the library, research some of these things, and you will find out very quickly how scary it is and how dangerous it can be. But I, I promise you, I didn't want to step up and be on a committee. I'm not a speaker, I'm a talker, but I'm not a speaker. Okay, so I'm doing my best, but I promise we are fighting. We are fighting. We need your feedback. Reach out to us. Go to our website. Email me. Call me. I'll give any of you my number. Hit me up anytime. It may take me a little bit of time to get back to you. I have a job also. But we will try to find the answer or get in leagues with those you know, resources that you've mentioned and try to find out what we can do to <coughs> toward, towards this cause of getting this out of our state. Back to Steve. Let's do a couple more questions and then we'll turn it over to some other folks. Okay. Yes, sir. Two more questions. Uh, I don't know when that started. It started in other states, I guess, before. I don't know. But did they have a, when did it start? And did they have a legitimate operation when they started? And they've had these pollutants to since that time, since you said the fertilizer board kicked them off. I, I don't know the answer to either of your questions. You know when they started? No, I, I, I don't know. I don't have that information. I don't know Gideon's personally. The Evans Basin, I believe, has been three years um, across from us. Um, but, but I could be off on that. But, uh, two, in the United States or just oh, I here? Saw. Uh, I know ours here personally. I don't know when they started spreading this Your question and then your question. Assuming when the lawsuit is, what will it change? It will require, you no, know, hopefully will, the judge will order the DNR to tell Denali you can't operate your basins anymore until you get solid waste permits. And that process generally takes three to five years to complete the five-step process. Doing the PSI, doing the DSI, writing the reports, getting a construction permit, building the facility, and getting your operating permit and getting the final DNR inspection. That process can take five years. If you're a business person, are you gonna let an asset sit idle for five years while you're spending thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on it? I don't think so. 
Yes, sir. Mr. Yetra, are you doing anything to help uh, give DNR some backbone? One of those incidents you listed on there was our property. And you know what DNR fined them for an over application that we had to move the cattle off of it for 45 days? It, we couldn't even whip our horses to drive across, to ride across the branch. It stunk so bad. Senator Carter and, and Senator Moon and Dirk Deaton uh, was in a committee that came out there and looked at it. I mean, it was pitiful. You know what DNR fined them for that? $15,000. They're the most inept, impotent group I've ever talked to in my life. So you're going to have to sue them, but you're going to have to keep in mind if uh, DNR is the keeper of the key, you might as well get Lone Mary, uh, Mary and Moe and Curly. One last question. Two things. Uh, Mr. Yetra, I mean, uh, finale. Center Grove is backed by Goldman Sachs. The other thing is, Plato, Missouri is located straight north of Mountain Grove and south of Fort Leonardwood, about halfway in between. Now, you know, all know what's up in there. So there is springs and water galore up in there. So they're going to put that stuff up in there and contaminate everything up there, and it's going to run down here. We're going to get it. What about the water? Do you want to turn over to these folks? <clears throat> Thank you for coming, everybody. I have a question for you. If you could share this, we'd appreciate it. DNR or the Denali wins a lawsuit for the fertilizer, it goes away. This whole deal goes away. I'm sorry, who asked the question? Me. Oh, what was it? Repeat that? What happens when, right now they are fighting the fertilizer to say that it's fertilizer again? If it, if they win and say it's fertilizer again, the whole DNR deal is over. Because it goes back to fertilizer. Well, no, that's not necessarily true because DNR is exempted. The fact remains what Denali collects from its commercial and industrial customers is solid waste, and that it's requires always, solid waste permits. What the fertilizer, fertilizer control permit. board does is not relevant to that. I know they've always been under the fertilizer permit, right? Correct. And all of a sudden, in June, they said, okay, it's not fertilizer. And they're fighting that. If they come back and say, okay, it is fertilizer, where do we go? We continue on and force DNR to force Denali to obtain the, the kind of permits they should have required in the first place. But they could keep operating under the fertilizer permit. That's right. I mean, it's fertilizer then. It's not. They can